Negative thinking is a major problem because you've got to, you've got to get control of this. You actually can control what this does. No one else is in charge. If the devil is in charge, it's because you gave him permission. You allowed him in. If God is operating up there, it's because you gave him permission. You allowed him in. It's, it's a very, listen to me. It's not a magic trick, man. If you want to be successful, you have to get control of this. Like I was telling her earlier, look, you can eradicate negative thinking from your life. Now, it's not going to say you're not going to ever have a negative thought. That's not human. I have them, but I don't have them nowhere near as frequent as I used to because I learned what they are, how they work. I get rid of them. I don't have time for you. I'm on a positive track. I got things I'm trying to accomplish. I got, I'm trying to be successful and I'm trying to be happy. If you're trying to be successful or happy, you have no room for negativity. The best way to mask yourself from negativity every morning is to start with gratitude. I'm telling you, man, it's a very simple process. Now, there are some books that you can buy. There's Norman Vincent Peale's The Power of Positive Thinking. It's a very old book. It's only in paperback. It's called The Power of Positive Thinking by Norman Vincent Peale. I read this book when I was 20. It started the process to change in my life. Then I read a book called The Magic of Thinking Big. It's by David Schultz. This just trains you how to think big. You know, it doesn't take any more brain power to think big than it does small. Big thinking gets rid of negativity. Dreams and visions gets rid of negativity. But you got to remember, man, that you operate. When you pray, God ain't the only one here to pray. The devil is listening to you. So his job is to dissuade you. His job is to keep you off track. Devil ain't got but one job. He don't want you to be successful. He don't want you to discover your dreams. He don't want you talking to God. So he get busy. He get busy. He busy, man. He send people your way all the time. He all over the internet. He all over social media. The devil got imps. He got people work for him all the time. All they do is just do what he say. Say something funky about her. Yeah. But you can control this part. Now, what you cannot do is bury yourself by using your success compared to other people. See, because here's the danger. Let me teach you this. Success is not how far you got. Because see, you're going to be disappointed all the time. Because somebody always further than you. So now you'll forever be disappointed. Success ain't how far you got. Success is how far you got from where you start. That's your success. That's yours. You can be successful. But if you constantly looking at somebody else, if I look at Oprah money, I start feeling bad about me. Because I ain't got Oprah money, man. Oprah got billion dollars. I don't have nowhere near no billion dollars. But you mean to tell me that I ain't smart enough to go? The daily, you have to prime yourself. You have to do something for 10 minutes minimum. If you don't have 10 minutes, you don't have a life. And- Ooh, that's so good. I mean, I just like, you gotta do it, right? That's good. If you don't have 10 minutes- You don't have a life. To give to priming yourself. That's right. You, don't have you a want life a prime that... life, you want a beautiful life, yeah. you're a beautiful family. Oh, I'm so, I'm so, I, I, I love that you but say that. But I do this first time I wake up in the morning. Yeah. This, the people always ask me, how are you so up all the time? But you know, part of it is I attend all these seminars, you know, yes. and teach all this. But the real reason is- You prime yourself. I prime myself. That's what I've done for years. It's like. I change my body this radical breathing pattern or movement. There's yeah. many ways to do it. But then I do it through 10 minutes. And I do it. It usually goes more because I'm enjoying it. Yeah. But 10 minutes is how I get myself to do it. Three and a half minutes of pure gratitude about three things. And I pick one of those three to be simple. Because I don't want to be the astronaut that, you know, he went to the moon, that was his idea of adventure, and then they all come back and were depressed because what do I do for the rest of my life? Yes. Yeah. So the wind in my face, you know, my children's faces, um, anything. And the reason for gratitude is, the two emotions that mess us up the most are fear and anger. Yeah. And you can't be grateful and fearful simultaneously. They don't go together. And you can't be angry and grateful simultaneously. So if you literally start your day cultivating that, this is part of talking about creating a highway to happiness. Yeah. And then I do three minutes of my three to thrive. What are three outcomes or results I'm really committed to? And I see them as done and fulfilled. And in um, 10 for minutes, that day? I, I usually get something at six months to 12 months out. Wow. Something that's a little bigger. And then but I feel it's fulfilled and done and I get thanks for it. And you're at the end of those 10 minutes, and usually it's 15 or 18 for me, I am so wired. Now I've done that for years. It's been the base of it. What's different with suffering is measuring it moment to moment over. And then the third one for me is 
okay, how do I love more? Love to me is an action. It's not a word, it's not an emotion. It's like, if you love, you act accordingly. So love, and what can I do in a loving way, and then what can I be grateful for? And that little three-step process ends the suffering. 70% of the time, people live in stress, and living in stress is living in survival. Now, all organisms in nature can tolerate short-term stress. You know, a deer gets chased uh, uh, by a pack of coyotes. When it outruns the coyotes, it goes back to grazing and the event is over. And the definition of stress is when your brain and body are knocked out of balance, out of homeostasis. The stress response is what the body innately does to return itself back to order. So you're driving down the road, someone cuts you off, you jam on the brakes, you may give them the finger, and then you settle back down and the event is over and boom. Now everything's back, back to normal. But what if it's not a predator that's waiting for you uh, outside the cave, but what if it's your coworker sitting right next to you and all day long you're turning on those chemicals because they're pushing all your emotional buttons. When you turn on a stress response and you can't turn it off, now you're headed for disease because no organism in nature can live in emergency mode for that extended period of time. It's a scientific fact that the hormones of stress down-regulate genes and create disease, long-term effects. Human beings, because of the size of the neocortex, we can turn on a stress response just by thought alone. We can think about our problems and turn on those chemicals. That means then our thoughts could make us sick. So if it's possible that our thoughts could make us sick, is it possible then our thoughts could make us well? The answer is absolutely yes. All of you have targets, things that you're after. If you're gonna get a new result, if you're gonna grow your business, if you're gonna be able to support your mom, if you're gonna get rid of the anxiety, if you're gonna be able to overachieve and not have all that fear inside of you, you obviously need to get a new result. You're gonna to have to get new action. We all know that. You don't get new results with old action. What human beings can do is amazing. What they will do is usually disappointing. It's not because we're not capable of it. It's because we don't have new actions because we get in certain emotional states that dominate us, like anxiety, like fear of failure. So if you're in a state of fear, you're gonna behave very differently and get very different results than if you were in a place of being courageous or bold or warm or connected or playful, any of those. So the most important key to changing your life in any situation is to change results, you gotta change behavior, but to change behavior, you gotta change the emotional state you're in. The fact is this, you are playing the program 95% of the day, meaning your life is a printout of your program. Anything you're struggling to try to accomplish, whether it's health or love, uh, relationships, whatever it is, if you're struggling, it represents a simple fact. Your subconscious programming doesn't support that conclusion. So the fact is, what are my programs? Look at your struggle. And wherever you're struggling, the struggle is not because the universe won't provide for you. The struggle is an internal job. The struggle is you're trying to overcome previous programming that prevents you to go to that destination. So the wonderful part about this understanding is you don't have to, to review your life. You can look right now at this one moment, just look at your head and say, what are the things that I keep trying to get? and they, they seem to be elusive. I can't get them, they're always out of reach. I say, the universe is not holding back. It's your own invisible subconscious behavior. And once you understand where the issues are, you start to really focus on the point that it's not the universe that's providing the trouble, it's myself. You have the first inclination, the first idea, the first understanding of how to change your life because now you know exactly what issue is confronting you. You can change the programming. You can rewrite your subconscious programs. If you took the wishes and desires of the conscious mind and used that as a program to put the beliefs into the subconscious mind, it's the most exciting and liberating thing you can ever do in your life. You know why? Because once it's in the subconscious program, 95% of the day without you even thinking about it, your mind will take you to that direction. And that is your freedom. I define concentration as the ability to keep that awareness on one thing for a prolonged period of time. So if I can keep my awareness on Eric and not drift away and think about the wedding, or drift away and think about the vacation, or what I'm going to do later, 
then I'm concentrating on it. Every time it drifts away, I bring it back. And the more I practice this, the more I practice concentration. So concentration is the ability to keep your awareness on one thing for a prolonged period of time. And that's a very simple definition of concentration. How do you get better at concentration? You practice this. You practice this 24 hours a day, seven days a week. And it's the only way to get good at it. And what's the best way to practice it? The best way to practice it is to integrate it into everything that you do in your life. Not to meditate 10 minutes in the morning. It doesn't work. You really need to look at your life the same way a sprinter in the Olympics looks at his life. We've all heard of Usain Bolt, the man that won the gold medal twice, two Olympics in a row, broke the world record. I don't know anything about him, to be honest. But if I was looked at him, I would assume he goes to the gym. <laughs> right? If you look at him, he's pretty ripped. He obviously sprints, he practices running, probably does a lot of long distance, he probably does a lot of stretching as well, I'm sure he gets massages. He looks like he eats the right kind of food, drinks the right amount of water, takes vitamins. His whole day is so disciplined, for what? To prepare him for 9.57 seconds, I think that's what the world record is, right? For 100 meters, 9.5 or 9.57 seconds. His whole day is preparing him for that short time not the other way around. A lot of people say, you know what, I need to be more concentrated. So you know what, I'm going to meditate in the morning, I'll sit down for two minutes. Okay, now I'm Zen master. <laughs> and the remaining 23 hours and 58 minutes, they just go about being ordinary and crazy. How does that work? How would you change? It's not balanced at all. So if for 23 hours and 58 minutes you were not being concentrated, you allowed your awareness to jump from one thing in your mind to another thing, to another thing, to another thing, to another thing, in an uncontrolled way, what would you be good at? The best way to do it is pick a few opportunities in your everyday life. For example, we all speak with people. When I speak with somebody, I give them my undivided attention. I keep my awareness on them. And the conversation is really brief. Why? Because we're concentrated. We're not being distracted. A 10 minute conversation normally just takes three minutes because you're just so focused. And out of a, a prolonged concentration comes the wonderful power of observation. You just become more observant. And when you become more observant, you see solutions quicker and you solve things quicker. And it's a wonderful, powerful feeling when somebody is concentrated on you and not being distracted. The only way to break a habit, you guys, is not to deal with the triggers. You're never going to get rid of the stress in your life, but you can 100% change your pattern of avoiding work. It's this fear of discomfort. People have this extreme feeling in their mind uh, when it comes to their associations with exercise. That's one of my first feeling that I could hit the ball from any part of the court and feel like I could do it with closed eyes and make it and know exactly where it's going. It made an impression on me. And since then, for the past 33 years, I've looked in the mirror every morning and asked myself, if today were the last day of my life, would I want to do what I am about to do today? If you try and change yourself according to thinking that, oh, I'm going to a different country or, you know, I need to please or I need to um, not be alien enough or you're overthinking it. So that's that one voice. This other voice that we walk very far away from is a voice saying, hey man, you ain't do this shit. So what you have to do first is turn up this voice over here. The voice saying things to you that aren't nice. Your body is like a race car that you can juice up yourself. Like you can add the fat tires. You can add the improved suspension. You can beef up the horsepower in the engine. You can do all that yourself. You have to be open to understand and accept the fact that you won't know everything. Okay. And people won't know everything about you. So it's an education. I'm enjoying so much. You have to accept your uniqueness. Yeah, I want to do things that people are like, oh, she's doing that too. I, I look for things like that. Whether it's acting, producing, I don't know what it'll be. Sure. I, I don't know. If you want to be an anomaly, you have to act like one. Like people want all these special things to happen, but then they're acting like everybody else. Victory. I wanted to win. Not like beat somebody else. It wasn't about that. I, I, I just wanted to go the distance. Everything in my life, when something got hard, I quit. It's this whole new perspective on it. And I think nature, I think 
the ease of suffering is always in presentness. You know, when you're in presentness, truly locked in, in presentness, there is no suffering. There can be pain, but no suffering. Suffering is, an, is something created by our own mind. Think, we all think our stuff is the best, and like, I get that. But yeah, that would be my advice, only because that also is liberating. To me, everything's about breathing, right? Like, to me, everything is about, like, take full ownership for everything, and then everything gets easy, because then you're in control. The more I did this, the more I gained confidence. And then the more I gained confidence, the more I realized I was just sacrificing. And then through that, all these different tools started coming up. But I would have never found these tools if I didn't put myself in a very uncomfortable place. Living in the present. So often, our mind is either in the past, focused on what didn't work out, who did us wrong, mistakes we've made, or it's in the future, thinking about our goals, worried about our finances. What if my health doesn't improve? The problem with being in the past or being in the future is you will miss the present. David said, this is the day the Lord has made. Today is a gift from God. Are you fully engaged? making the most of each moment, loving your family, appreciating the simple things in life? Or are you in yesterday? Are you in tomorrow? The reason some relationships are not healthy is you came home from work, but you didn't really show up. Your mind was somewhere else. You played with your child, but you were in tomorrow, thinking about how you were going to accomplish that goal. Or you went to the office, your body was there, but your mind was in yesterday thinking about what you should have done better. If you're going to be fulfilled, you have to show up for life. You have to be there when you get there. Not show up and be in the future, worried about how it's going to work out. Not show up and be in the past, live in regrets, dwelling on your disappointments. Come into today. Yes, it's good to have goals. I'm all for having vision, but you can't be so focused on what's next that you miss what you have right now. I know people that lost what they had going after what they wanted. They were so intent on reaching their goal, doing great things that they took their family for granted. They came home, but they weren't there. They were distracted, thinking about what was next, planning for the future. They never came into the present. Victoria and I used to travel to India with my father. We had been married for a couple of years and on this particular trip, on the way home, we were going to stop in Paris. My father was going to minister there for a few days. and We were so excited, our first time being in Paris together. Before we left home, we put an offer in for a house that we really wanted to buy. We had sold our town home and we found this place that we loved. Had a nice yard and big trees. And the house was so light and open, it was perfect. When we arrived in Paris, the first thing we did was call our realtor and ask if she had heard anything. She said nothing. The next morning, we woke up, called the realtor. Any news? Still nothing. During the day, we would go out and look at sites. The whole time, we were talking about that house, believing we were going to get it. As we walked the streets of Paris, we took pictures of things that we'd like to do to our new house. Here's a front we could put on it. Here's how we could do the landscaping. We were in Paris, but we weren't really there. Our mind was somewhere else. We were in the future all the while missing the present. We could have been making the most of that moment, enjoying the sights, taking in that beautiful city. But because we were so focused on what we wanted, we missed what we had. If I could go back now and say, Joel, enjoy where you are, be present. At the right time, the doors will open, the opportunities will come, but while you're waiting, stay in the now. And so, this is why we are here, and this is the meaning of retreat. It's a retreat from yourself in order to find what the Buddhists would call the no-self, 
or what other teachings would call the deeper self or the Atman or the your Buddha nature or the Christ within whatever term you want to use to point to it and that's why we're here so all the external things here are helpful it's easier here to connect with the depths of who you are and realize the depths of who you are of course when you leave here then you get challenged again it's not that you don't get challenged here too and especially if you are still very much identified with the mind you find many challenges wherever you go this isn't right don't like that he doesn't look very spiritual to me or the opposite all these people are so much more spiritual than me do they know that I'm not spiritual so the practice is to voluntarily as much as possible relinquish identification with the thinking mind and your usual self and what very much helps with that is just bring just as much as you can don't walk around as a heavy personality in person with it no walk around as a light as if a field of conscious perception and like a little child it goes and look at everything in other words presence presence practice here it's more con easier th than in your usual surroundings presence practice present moment practice there's a lot of nature here I recommend taking walks in nature looking at the trees at the sky there's a lake the grass and flowers many many lovely things be as present as you can and alert and as you walk around from one building to another from here to there really perceive don't that already is a liberation from the usual self because you're not thinking you cannot really perceive your surroundings fully when you're when your usual self is talking to you and it's, it's probably not talking about this present moment it's talking about what you're going to encounter when you get back home or what happened last week or it's, it's doubting that being here is actually a good thing or it's criticizing something that shouldn't really be here but it's here you don't want to because that's not a retreat you haven't really retreated you've retreated on an external level but you have not used this opportunity to retreat from your usual self your usual mind paying attention is being present and it's a skill just like golf or tennis the more you practice it the better you get at it and you know when someone's present with you in your life because they're paying attention to you and you know when they're not present with you because they're not paying attention to you. So now, what's the relevance of that? Well, there's an intelligence that's giving you life that's always present. And many people don't take the time to connect to it by being present, right? So if where you place your attention is where you place your energy, and all of your attention is in the present moment, you got a lot of energy in the present moment. Now think about this. When I talk about being present, I'm saying that once you fall into the generous present moment, according to the quantum model of reality, all possibilities exist in the eternal now. So most people, they wake up in the morning, they come back to their senses. Your brain is a record of the past. It's, a, it's an artifact. It's, a, it's a circuits of, of everything you've learned and experienced to this moment. So people wake up in the morning and they think about their problems. Those problems are connected to certain people certain things at certain times and places. The moment they start thinking about the problems, they're turning on the circuits from the past, their memories. All those memories are connected to emotions because emotions are the end product of past experiences. So that problem has the feeling of disgust, frustration, anger, judgment, hatred, and if how you think and how you feel creates your state of being, 
and thoughts are the language of the brain and feelings are the language of the body, that person's entire state of being is in the familiar past. And when you're in the familiar past, you crave the predictable future. So then what happens next? They come back to their senses, they sit up, they check their cell phone, they do their WhatsApp, they do their Twitter, they do their text, they do Facebook, they take a picture of their feet, they post it on Facebook, they tweet something, they check one email, they check another email, they check the news, and now their entire brain is connected to everything known in their life. Then they stand up and they go through a, a series of routine behaviors. They use the toilet, they get, go to the kitchen, have a cup of coffee or a cup of tea, they go in the shower, they wash themselves the same way, they put on the same clothes, they walk out to the kitchen, they eat cereal with the same spoon, facing the same direction, they drive to work the same way, they do the same things, see the same people, they push the same emotional buttons, and, and they do this every day. So now their body is programmed into a predictable future based on what they did in their past and they lost their free will to a program. And so now, if you're not getting up in the morning being defined by a vision of the future, huh, then you'll be predictable in your life. You're left with the old memories of your past. So then, as I said, the stronger the emotion that you have some problem or person in your present reality, the more you're going to pay attention to that person or problem. And if where you place your attention is where you place your energy, all of your energy and your attention is going to all these different people and problems and places. <laughs> and now, every one of those people and problems and places has a neurological network in your brain. Is it real forgiveness if you refuse to forget the pain, the sadness, or the anger that the person made you feel? Is it real forgiveness if you won't let go of that? You are who you've been looking for. So stop looking for more unless you're looking in a mirror because it's about time for you to see clearly that you are who you've been looking for. And that empty feeling you got, that hole in your chest, you only got that feeling because you think you're not blessed with everything you need. You see, we live in a consumerist society, which means they need you to buy stuff. And the easiest way to sell it is to tell you you're not enough. Buy this car, you'll get girls. Buy this bra, you'll get guys. <laughs> and we're seeing it so much that we start believing these lies. But the truth is, the makeup they're selling to make you feel prettier is the same makeup you buy to stop feeling shittier about this lie they keep telling you that you are not enough. <laughs> And what about the movies we watch, all the shows on TV? The more I watch, the more I see I need you to complete me. And yes, love is the answer, love is the key, but if you can't love yourself, how could you ever love me? And, and loving yourself, what does that even mean? Like massages and selfies and that sort of thing? Because the more I think about it, the more it feels weird. I've always been taught that self-love was something to be feared. I've been taught that arrogance is bad and vanity it's not good and even my bracelets are telling me to act how Jesus would so what should I do? <laughs> how should I act? I'm supposed to love myself but how do I even do that? Well I got a trick that I picked up from a friend who noticed that I was quick to defend her when she would say something negative about herself. She would say I'm so dumb and I'd say you're so brilliant. She'd say, I'm so weak, and I'd say, you're so resilient. And when she said, I feel ugly, and I said, you look beautiful, she asked me why I was so dutifully filling up her cup constantly, and yet treating my own cup so irresponsibly. Because when I looked in the mirror, my voice was quite clear. You're ugly, you're too thin, your hairline's receding, you got a pimple on your chin. And that was when she gave me a piece of advice that changed my life. She gave me a hug and she said, treat yourself like someone you loved. Treat yourself like someone you loved. Now I had been standing, but I needed to be sitting because I couldn't believe that I had been letting myself keep forgetting that I was who I'd been looking for. 
And deep in my core, I knew it was time to stop looking for more until I could look through all my fear and look into a mirror and see clearly that the man looking back at me was the only one who can make me happy, and I am already enough. And I am not any more special or unique than you. That is why I'm here to speak to you. You are already enough. And when you start to see that, you will start to be that. Your world will get brighter, your load will get lighter, and you can see that with life, you can be a lover, not a fighter. And that life, you deserve it. Because you are worth it. And there is no point in letting yourself keep forgetting because no matter what you say or do, you are perfect. And so today, I hope I leave you with a direction correction away from the flaws you see in your reflection. They aren't flaws to me, they are simply protection against all the doubts you have of your perfection. So start today. Take a good, long look in the mirror and say, I am who I've been looking for. How much do you love yourself? Because if you understand the value of self-love, then you would never fuck with a girl like that. You would never fuck with a dude like that. You would never be friends with those type of people or ever accept any invites that has to do with this or that. I already know how you're going to make me feel because I've hung out with you before and you've already made me feel that way multiple times. So you continue to invite me and I continue to show up because I'm desperate to have friends. I'm desperate for the validation of all of these people being around me, feeding me, feeding me, feeding me. I ain't shit until you tell me that I'm the shit. I don't love me until you tell me that you love me. I don't like me until you tell me that you like me. Most of the people out here are running around empty. They have no sense of self, no sense of self-love. When I say self-love, it has nothing to do with celebrity, money, materialistic things, and all of the things that your negative mind could probably go to. It has nothing to do with self-love, has nothing to do with looks, nothing to do with cars and any of the superficial things that one would assume that could make you love yourself even more. It's a matter of knowing your value. It's a matter of you saying, I don't have to be around these people in these type of environments and situations in order for me to finally see the value in myself. I love me independent of you loving me. I believe in me. I know my self-worth. I know clearly that I'm a child of God and God has a purpose over my life. And if he didn't, I wouldn't be here anymore. And I don't need you to tell me that. I don't need you to validate me. When you give me compliments, it inspires me to keep going. But you're not the reason I'm doing this. The comments, the feedback, the energy is not the reason I do what I do. I am here and I have a purpose. There is no value in having wisdom, knowledge, insight, spirituality, love, and, and having all of this stuff that I'm aware of, and I'm not perfect, I've had flaws. Every day, I am a work in progress. Forgiveness is giving up the hope that the past could be any different. I think for myself, and I know many of you, you think forgiving means accepting what has happened to you. Well, it is accepting that it has happened to you. Not accepting that it was okay for it to happen. It is accepting that it has happened and now what do I do about it? Forgiving is giving up the hope, not holding on, hoping, wishing that it could have been any other way 
than it actually was, giving up the hope that the past could be any different. And when I got that, I think it took me to the next level of being a better person because I don't hold grudges for anything or any situation and neither should you. It's letting go so that the past does not hold you prisoner, does not hold you hostage. Stop scaring yourself. <clears throat> and here we go into fear. How often do you terrorize yourself with your own thoughts? <laughs> you get into absolute terror and it's only coming from your thoughts. Nobody out there is doing a thing. Sometimes it's an old family pattern. Sometimes we get new things. How many people here are absolutely in terror of earthquakes? <clears throat> and how often do you do that to yourself? You know, we find so many ways to scare ourselves. I would like people, to, when you have time, to make a list of your fears. Make a list of your fears. And then give yourself the opportunity to turn each fear into a positive affirmation. Turn each one into something positive. And remember, always you are in charge. You are always in charge. See, one idle thought doesn't make a whole lot of difference. It's like a, but thoughts are like drops of water. You drop a drop of water on the table here, and it doesn't mean much. But if you keep dropping and keep dropping and treat dropping, you get, a, the table becomes a wash, and then you get a puddle on the floor, and then you can get a little pond and a lake, and finally you can create an ocean. And with our own thoughts, we can drown in a sea of negativity, or we can float on the ocean of life. And it's up to us. The thoughts we think accumulate. And what sort of puddles are you standing in? Or are you up to here? Or are you up to here and trying to paddle? You know, what are you doing to yourself? When we're willing to change our thinking, we can change our experiences. And it doesn't matter if you've got a big a puddle of negative thoughts. You know, you can move over here and create a puddle of marvelous positive thoughts. You can make changes, always. So you want to turn those fear thoughts into positive affirmations. Let them work for you. See, life is cyclic. You're not, what is, whatever experience you're having right now, it has not come to stay. It has come to pass. Not to stay, just to pass. It's just going through. The biggest challenge is, is to know what's happening. This is a part of this thing we call life. This too shall pass. And maintaining perspective, putting it in perspective. I was doing a training at a college and it was a two day training during orientation. And in the training that I provide, I'm a motivational speaker, but I conduct processes in personal dynamics where people begin to go through changes that stimulate the right and left hemisphere of the brain, enable them to see themselves differently. I conducted this particular simulation with these young kids, 17 and 18 years of age, so that they would begin to see how they make decisions or how they would survive in this particular simulation process we gave them. We had them to do it individually and then collectively. Over 30% of them wrote down as their first option in order to survive, they would commit suicide. First thing they wrote down, suicide among young people has increased 300%, over 5,000 will successfully take their lives this year. Why? Why did they do that? They I said, I was so shocked. I said, what do you mean? Well, at least we would not suffer. And then they had the nerve to write down all of the other things they were going to do after they committed suicide. I said, listen, Kadumbo. <laughs> no, when you, when you come up with a permanent solution for a temporary problem, that's it. Game's over. That's it. You're not going to do anything. Anybody wrote suicide at the top, you can put your pencil down. 
Christ. <laughs> See, a lot of us, because of our limited vision of ourselves, a lot of us who begin to focus on problems and enable them to overwhelm us, we begin to think that we have no options. We begin to believe that there's no way out. Repeat after me, there's always a way. Where there's a will, there's a way. Shake somebody's hand on your right and left and say, I'm unstoppable. You've got to make those kind of declarations to yourself. I'm unstoppable. This will not get me down. And if I get knocked down, I'm going to be like um, Leo Pascal. You said you're going to have some low moments in life, but when you do, you will have high lows <laughs> when you work on yourself. What are some of those things that you can do during this period of time? Go for walks. Do some things for you. Just go for a stroll so you can engage in some reflective thinking on life, on yourself, looking and enjoying the universe, smelling the roses along the way. Listen to upbeat music, music that inspire you. I have only but goodies. I have strategies that I engage in to recharge my batteries. I'm preparing for that because I know things are going to happen that I cannot anticipate. Very good friend of mine died the other day. I had a program for myself. I have books that I read that inspire me, tapes that I listen to that fire me up because you're going to have sometimes low moments when you won't want to get out of bed. You just want to stay there. At times you won't want to come out the house. At times you'll be feeling bad and don't know why. What's wrong? I don't know. <laughs> Just leave me alone. <laughs> why did that happen? I don't know. It's called life. <laughs> the other thing is take full responsibility for your life. Accept where you are and the responsibility that you're going to take yourself where you want to go. So one said we have two primary choices in life. We can either accept conditions as they exist or we can take the responsibility to change them. See, a lot of people want to exempt themselves from taking responsibility. All they want to do is talk about the problem. Every time you see them, they'll tell you their story over and over and over and over again. No, no. You want to take responsibility for your life. I got me here. I can get me out of this. And I'm getting out. I'm not going to be a volunteer victim. George Bernard Shaw said there are two kinds of people in life. You know, he said those that make things happen, those that watch things happen, and those that don't know what happened. <laughs> And he said, the people that get along in this life look around for the circumstances that they want. And if they can't find them, they make them. They create them. So part of beginning to get unstuck, you've got to decide that the behavior pattern that you have adopted doesn't work for you. You've got to change your strategies. And changing your strategy means reinventing your life. Recreating you. And you have the power to do that. You can decide that you're going to change, that you're not going to be a wimp. You can decide that you're going to stand up to life. You can decide that I'm going to live each day as if it were my last. You can, you have the power to make that decision. You can decide I'm going to work on myself and develop myself. I'm going to empower me. And all of these things that are happening to me right now, they're just temporary inconveniences. They're not stronger than I am. I'm in charge here. <laughs>